Well, thank you for tuning in tonight. My name is Stan Adams. I'm with the Word and Sword TV broadcast, and we're coming to you live from the WHKY studios in Hickory, North Carolina. And we thank you for tuning in tonight and for being with us on our show. We know there are some other uh, distractions tonight, but we're glad that you're with us, and we thank you so much. If you have been listening to us for uh, on a regular basis, I'd like to ask a favor of you tonight. If you would call in our, to, to our operators and let them know that how long you've been listening and how long, long you've been watching the program, and uh, <clears throat> just uh, just kind of let them know that. We would like to uh, kind of have a record of that, if you don't mind doing that. Take the time to call in, and the number is 828-485-5555. Operators are standing by now. And that's just a favor we'd like to ask of you, if you're able to do that. And we thank you for taking the time to do that. Uh, call operators, as we said, are standing by. You can call and ask for a copy of this presentation, and we'll put the chart up there so you can write the information down. Uh, you can ask for this presentation, or ask for a free correspondence course, ask for a free tract, for a map to the building, ask to be added to the church uh, bulletin mailing list, the beacon, and also arrange a personal Bible study if you'd like, because this program is all about uh, reaching lost souls and reaching souls with people that have concerns and questions about the religious world in general and about Bible, the, what the Bible teaches and what it doesn't. And also, you can go to our website at www.wordandsword.com. You want to spell out the word and. And also, tonight, if you will, this is your program as well as ours, and you can call in with a Bible question or a comment, and also we will do our best to give you a biblical book, chapter, and verse answer because it is the Word of God that matters. It's not what we think or what you think, what your church teaches or what somebody else teaches. It's what the Bible says, and that's the basis upon which we'll be judged on that last day. The Word of God, we believe, is inspired. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God might be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. It's a complete book. We don't need little whispering going on or angels sent to us. We just need to look at the Bible, and it's our guide. And when we read, we can understand. So we want to thank you for tuning in tonight. We also want you to know that we have uh, also another other ways that you can contact us that are a little more up-to-date and modern with the world today. So if you would like to, to do that, you can like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash word and sword or www.facebook.com slash Newton, North Carolina, Church of Christ. And you can also follow us on Twitter at word and sword. Post Bible questions up there if you would like or if you'd like a study or if you'd like us to answer you by those means, we would appreciate that. And again, if you've been watching our program for uh, on a regular basis, we would like to know if you would just call in to our operators and let them know that tonight. So many of you have been, and we appreciate that. It's very much appreciated over the years, and we thank you for that, taking the time to do that. We invite you to attend the assemblies at the Newton Church of Christ at 656 St. James Church Road, and also the, the Sunday morning is at 9.30 and Wednesday, or Wednesday nights at 7, and then worship times on Sunday is at 11 o'clock. So that's 9.30, 11 o'clock on Sunday, and then 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. So the Word and Sword is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. Again, we want to get it out right up front. Don't send us any money. Uh, we are, the program is totally paid for by the Newton Church of Christ, part of their work, and uh, you, this is all finance. Don't need your money. We just want you to study the Bible, learn what God wants you to do, obey it, and go to heaven. That's all we're about. You can contact us uh, by going to email. Uh, also, if you would just like to contact us in a regular way, you can email us at contact at wordandsword.com. And also, you can contact us by phone at the building at 828-465-3009 or by mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. Or again, go to our website at www.wordandsword.com.
www.thepeopleshow.com. What's the most important thing in the world? Where you're going to end up. Where will you spend eternity? What will you do with your soul? What condition are you in right now if you pass from this life? Have you done what God asked you to do in order to be saved? Have you heard the gospel? Jesus says that we must hear him. We must hear what he has to say. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the word of God. In John 8, 24, Jesus says, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. And so Romans 10, 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made. Galatians 3, 26, we are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And also Luke 13 and verse 3, we see there that Jesus says that we must repent. Acts 17 also, Paul in talking to those on Mars Hill said that uh, God had, in different times um, dealt with men in a different way, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. And so confession also is important. Jesus says, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven, Matthew 10, 32. And also we see here that we must be baptized for the remission of our sins. Not just baptized into a church. Not be just baptized to join a church. And certainly not baptized because you're already saved. That is nowhere taught in the Bible. Baptism is the single act that puts you into Christ. Now all the rest of them lead you unto Christ. And they are absolutely essential for your salvation. But baptism is the lone act where you contact the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism. And it is that blood that washes you clean from your sins. No salvation on this side of the water. You must go through the water in order to be saved. And that's because that's where the blood is applied, Romans 6. And then we must be faithful. We can lose our salvation. We can walk away from the Lord, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. If you fulfill the commandments that the Lord wants you to do, He'll add you to His church. In Acts 2.47, those that were baptized for the remission of their sins, after they had repented, were added to the body of Christ. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And in Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death, and thou shalt receive the crown of life. So what do we see from this chart here? Well, we see from the chart, folks, that you must do the things that God has commanded you to do. We put scriptures up there about what Jesus taught and then what the apostles taught. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles into all truth. And so they were teaching the same things. Truth agrees with truth. And that is how you are in the right relationship with God. Someone says, well, I'm in a right relationship with God because I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior, invited Him into my heart, and said the sinner's prayer. Well, that would be fine if you could find someone that did that in the Bible. But you can't do that. You can find examples of people that prayed. You can find examples of people that were told to do certain things. But what you have to do to come to the conclusion that that's all you have to do is to cherry pick Bible scriptures and pick one out that you like. Notice as we and the chart we just put up there, and if you'd like a copy of this chart, be glad to send it to you free of charge. It's, it's important to hear the gospel, important to believe the gospel. Couldn't be saved without that. To repent of your sins, to confess Christ. But you must be baptized for the remission of your sins to be in Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. If we're baptized into Christ, we have put on Christ, and until then you have not. Acts 22, verse 16, Paul, after seeing Jesus on the road to Damascus, was told to go into the city and it would be told him what he should do, what he must do. Words wherewith you might be saved. And in Acts 22, verse 16, Ananias asked him, he said, Now why are you tarrying? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling or appealing to the name of the Lord or to the authority of Jesus Christ. So friends, 
these are what the Bible teaches. These are the things the Bible teaches. There are many other things that talk about saving us, but we just can't pick one passage out and say, that's my passage. I'm going to go with that one and leave the rest of them out. That's not honest. And I think we all know that. So we must take the whole of what God has said about salvation and then do what God has asked us to do and commanded us to do. These are not multiple choice things. These are not things that you can pick one, leave out the others. They're not exclusive from one another. They work together for what we call the plan of salvation for mankind. And God is the author of that plan. Well, we're going to talk tonight about how long you're going to live. Do you know how long you're going to live? A lot of people, can, let me ask you tonight, if, you, if, you, if I ask you to call in and tell me what moment, what hour, what day, what year you're going to depart this life, could you tell me? And I think all of us know that, that we couldn't do that. Insurance companies build their businesses on that, that nobody knows. And so they take certain risk and they, they go from that. But how long will you live? We don't know. We may not live through this TV program tonight. We may not live tomorrow till tomorrow. Or we may live for 20, 30 more years. We do not know. Well, how long do most people live? Did you know that if you live to be 74 to 76 years old, that you have lived 27,375 days. Now when you put it in days, that doesn't sound like much, does it? But that's how long you have lived. And let's just part that down. If you're 25 years old, how many days do you have left? If you live to be 74 to 76, you have 18,250 days approximately. And then if you're 50, you have 9,125 days left. If you're 65, you have 3,650 days left if you die at 75 to 74 to 76. Not much time, is it? So what, did that, what does that do? What does that make us think about? Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, let's look at Psalm chapter 90. And let's go to verse, verse 9 here. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath, and we spend our years as a tale that is told. What story are you telling? What does your life say? What imprint are you making in this world? What does your life mean? Does it have any meaning? And then the days of our years, in verse 10 of Psalm chapter 90, the days of our years are threescore and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore, yet it is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. And the conclusion of all this is in verse 12. So Lord, teach us to number our days so that we can apply our hearts to be wise. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Beautiful passage of Scripture. The psalmist brings out that we do not know. We spend our years like a tale that is told. We've all heard the analogy of the little dash between the dates on the tombstones. And what does your dash mean? Our life does have meaning. Our life is like a vapor, James tells us in James 4 that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. In the whole scope of eternity and the eternal things, our life is a period on a piece of paper. And overall with us, it's a pretty long time. But our life goes in cycles. We spend our years like a tale that is told. The days of our years are by reason of strength, about 80. 70 to 80 years old is the general lifespan that we have even today. I think that uh, now 81 is what's predicted. 
uh, because of our medical procedures that we have in medicine. And that's the average of the, uh, the time that average age that people pass. Even at that, that's not a long time. Have you learned to number your days? That doesn't mean count them like we've just talked about. It just means have we learned to make each day count for the Lord? Have we learned what's important and what's not? Have we learned to put the kingdom first, Matthew 6, verse 33, and His righteousness? In our early years, just to look at our focus on years and time, as a small child, do you remember, or have you talked to your grandchildren or your children remembering this? When you, and, or remember this about yourself. You remember the time when you were very anxious to tell people that you were two and a half, or three and a half, or four and a half, or I'm almost five, or I'm almost six? Well, that didn't last long, did it? All the way up to the time you're 16, or 18, or 21, you're anticipating that next age. But then people reach 30, they hit 40, they slide into 50, and they make it to 60. Then when they get to be 70, they got to reach that. <clears throat> and then we change. <clears throat> we start telling people we're almost 80, we're almost 90. We're almost 100, if we get that far. Isn't it interesting how these things change? From childhood, we're almost this, we're almost that. And then as we get up to old age, <coughs> pardon me, we get to a point where we're almost again. We're funny, aren't we? We're funny human beings. The United States is not the oldest society in the world. Other societies have been much older than us, but we are relatively a young nation. There's about 35 million people in our country right now that are 60 or 60 to 65 years old. There are 25 million teenagers in this country. Did you know it's the first time in all of history in this country that there have been more older people than teenagers? That's interesting. We wonder about our culture. A lot of that's because a lot of us baby boomers had gray hairs. There's a whole lot more of us. And so that's part of that. But if you wonder sometimes when you go to church services and things like that, while you look around and you see gray-headed people, well, that's because <laughs> that's where most of the people are. They're in that age group. It's not anything that's an anomaly, but it does show us that we need to be concerned with teaching the next generations to be what they need to be. Someone has said that there's three stages of life. There's youth, and there's adulthood, and then, my oh my, you look good for your age. Again, our life moves on quickly. In Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 27, the writer there, Jeremiah, says it's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. In other words, youth is a time of strength, and it's time for a man to bear a yoke. It's, it is in his youth. We're going to be talking tonight <clears throat> about the stages of life, a biblical guide through the stages of your life and of my life. Now, in all of this, let's remember that we're not assuming that we will live a particular age, but we're looking at if we live, these are the stages of life we will go through. So let's look at childhood for a moment. Let's look at childhood. Well, the challenges of childhood are many. One thing is you're looking up at everybody's kneecaps all the time. And you are fully dependent, when you come into this world, on your parents, on older people. 
you have limited choices. You're restricted quite a bit in what you can do. And you are in a training uh, procedure. Nobody seems to understand you in your childhood. And we need to remember that as older people. We don't need to forget what it's like to be young. Time takes long, a long time to pass when you're young. But as we get older, it moves along a lot quicker, doesn't it? Well, an hour, a day, a year, these are terms that when we're children, they sort of mean the same thing, don't they? We don't really pay much attention to time. Everybody else does, it seems, but we don't. The word child is used, on, uh, amazingly, 1,842 times in the New King James Version of the Bible. In various forms, the word child is used there. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 1 through 11, notice what the proverb writer, the wise man, says. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, and do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me. And he said to me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commands, and live. These are the words of a father to a child. As children, we ought to all understand that our parents can give us, give us words of life spiritually, certainly, but also physically. Listen, and it also tells us as parents, you need to learn what to say to your children. God has entrusted you with these children. The psalmist says that children are a blessing from the Lord, and blessed is the man that has his quiver full of them. They're a blessing from God, children are. Well, get wisdom, the father says to the son in Proverbs 4, 1 through 11. Get understanding, and do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth, and do not forsake her, and she'll preserve you. Love her, talking about wisdom, and she'll keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, talking about wisdom, and she'll promote you. She'll bring you honor when you embrace her. She'll place on her head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she'll deliver to you. Hear, my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right path. I want to ask you something. Can your children, and can you say that you have led your children in the right paths? And do your children recognize that you are doing everything you can to lead them into the right paths? Now, we would be remiss tonight if we avoided a very broad, a very important subject that has been around for a long time in our country. In 1973, our country, um, there was a, a decision made by the Supreme Court that abortion would be allowed in our country. In other countries, it's been allowed, but our country legalized abortion, and at one time it was outlawed, but now it is not. And since 1973, friends, there have been 50,794,000 abortions, and these figures are changing every day. It's estimated that there are 115,000 abortions in the world each day. Someone says, I don't, I don't think it's that high. Yes, it is. Those are the statistics. Look them up. Google them. Do you know that there have been more, more killed in abortions? There have been 49 times more people or more children killed by abortions that have been than men and women that have been killed in all the wars that our country has fought since its inception. Adolf Hitler slew, slew three million Jews 
and he's called a butcher. He's called a, a renegade. He's called a madman. But yet our country authorizes abortions, and even now, abortions up to the ninth month. That's been in the news, and we all, we all read about that. We all know that and understand that. Well, someone says, well, people need to be, people are having abortions because uh, they're, they're sick or because they're poor. Well, did you know that less than 2% of the people that have an abortion are having it because they are unable to afford a child? They give that as a reason many times, but 57% of abortions are from the white community with people that can generally afford an abortion. Insurance companies, many of them will pay for an abortion. And that is where we've come to. Now in our country and in this election that's coming up, and I'm not going to take, tell you who to vote for, but I'm just going to tell you that if somebody is running that does not believe in killing babies, and someone is, I'm going to be talking personally, myself, my own decision. I'm going to be following the person that follows the principles of God. Someone says, well now, is that a principle of God? Is it wrong to kill a child? Well, according to the psalmist it is. Turn to Psalm 139 and verses 13 through 16. And let's just read Psalm 139 and let's look at verses 1, or 13 through 16. The psalmist says, You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden, the psalmist says, from you, when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lower parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. The days were fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them." Folks, that passage right there says that there is life in the womb, and it is from inception. So you think about that, and. The scriptures talk about life existing inside the womb. And up, up to a few years, up, up to just this past year, that has been the rule that life exists in the womb. Well, if life exists in the womb, does personality exist in the womb? According to that passage, it does. Now, look, if you will, also at Isaiah 44 and verse 2. Isaiah 44, 2. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you in the womb, who will, who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen." Okay, so God formed you in the womb, and He talks about personality, formed you in the womb. Isaiah 44, verse 24, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, He who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord, I make all things. I stretch out the heavens all alone. I spread abroad the earth by myself. God forms us in the womb. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I adorned you, or I, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God talking to Jeremiah. So Jeremiah was formed in the womb, and God knew him before he was born. Pretty clear, isn't it? And then Job 31 in verse 15, Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion all of us in the womb? Again, personality in the womb. Job 10:18. Why then have you brought me out of the womb? Oh, that I had perished, and no eye had seen me. Psalm 127, verse 3, the passage we read, we referred to before. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. They're not a curse. They're not a growth. 
They're not a tumor. Life in the womb is a being, and it has rights. In Exodus 21, verse 22 through 23, if men fight and hurt a woman with child, notice that. God uses that term, a woman with child, to talk about a pregnant woman. She's not a, a, a woman who has a growth in her stomach. She's not someone with excess tissue. She is a woman with child. And notice this, if men fight and hurt a woman with child, so she gives birth prematurely, no harm follows. He shall surely be punished if there's no harm that follows. In other words, if the child doesn't die. According to the woman's husband's imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, he shall die. The death penalty for someone who hurts a woman and causes her to give birth prematurely, and she die, or the child dies. That's a major, that's, that's pretty clear, isn't it? God imposed the death penalty on someone that does that. You know in our country, and even in the laws of the state of North Carolina, that if a, a person shoots a pregnant woman, and the child and the woman die, they're tried for double murder, double homicide. We still recognize that, but isn't it odd that if that woman lives and that child dies by an abortion, there's no problem. There is no difference, folks. Well, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Know this, and then the last times, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good things, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, and they are without natural affection. In Isaiah 49, verse 15, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, but I will not. Psalm 106, they even sacrifice their sons and daughters to demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to idols in Canaan. The land was polluted with their blood. And that's talking about child sacrifice. What is abortion? How is it different from child sacrifice? The underlying problem, folks, with abortion is it's the same as murdering children in a religious service to an idol. Someone has called abortion our national sin. And I believe that all of us, including the one that's talking to you right now, me, that we're way, way, way too lackadaisical in this. We're too intimidated. The subject of abortion is a Bible subject. It's a subject that the Bible addresses. And we do need to t tell what the Bible says, don't we? I'm not taking a political position right now. I'm just telling you what the Bible says about killing babies, killing a child. Is there an alternative to abortion? Yes. Yes. There is, but, and it's called adoption, okay, adoption. In Psalm 100, he who sheds innocent blood is like those that sacrifice to idols. Well, we wanted to deal with that right up front because in talking about childhood, the very first thing we should recognize as people, as decent people, people who believe in the Bible, and believe what the Bible teaches. The very least we can do for a child is to let them live, isn't it? To allow them to come into this world and have a chance to live a life that's pleasing to God. 
that's the very basic that, that, that we can do and, and decent thing that we can do. Someone says, well, it's better for a child not to come into the world. And Well, wait a minute. Do you have to kill the child? For whatever reason, some may say that they have a reason why they do the abortions because they can't afford it, because it's an accident, because someone raped them, whatever. The child is still a child. They have a right to come into the world. There are people who are ready and standing in line. The estimated figure recently that I heard was over two million couples are waiting to adopt children. They are standing in line waiting to adopt children. And that's worldwide, by the way. Is there no one that will take an infant child into their home? There are a lot of people who will. They're waiting to give that child a good life. Now friends, we are remiss as a society. If we turn our heads and act like this doesn't happen, it does happen every day. 115,000, it's not on the news each night how many babies died that day, but it should be. And we need to be a people that are enraged over that. It is righteousness that exalts a nation. And when there are enough of us that will sit by silently and let these things go on and never ever raise a voice against it, we're wrong. And we'll answer for that. Second John 9 through 11, He that goes onward and abides not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And then verse 11 says, we cannot even bid God speed to the one that is not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. Well, we have a nation that is not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. And we are complicit with them if we say nothing. Friends, we've all heard the saying, Descartes, whoever you want to give it to, the attention to, if we do not learn the lessons of history, we're doomed to repeat it. If we don't recognize that, that the very basic idea of, of, of humanity, there has to be a respect for life. If we stop respecting life in the womb, it's not long before people my age and older will be disrespected too, and they'll do away with us. If you can have infanticide, you can have genocide. If you have homicide, all of those, and we can have the old people just lose their value, and it's no more to kill an old person, the time will come if we keep doing the things we're doing and have no respect for life. What basis do we have to say, well, you know what? It's not a viable economic investment to let an older person live to be 100. Cost us too much or a person that has a disease or has some illness like diabetes or has an illness like leukemia or cancer. It just costs too much to heal them, so we'll just do away with them. Because you see, it's quality of life, we'll say. Well, now wait a minute. God recognizes that we have a life to live and we are to live our lives as long as we can. And man does not have the right to call our life to an end. Doesn't have that right. In Proverbs 4, verses 1 11, seek wisdom, friends. Listen to what the Father tells the Son. And the Son is great, is, is blessed to be in this life, and He's depending on the Father to teach Him. The first thing the Father should teach, one of the first things, is a respect for God, but also a respect for others. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Friends, those little babies that are dying, 115,000 a day, they feel what happens to them. They know what happens to them. And it hurts. And we can't hear them scream, but they do. Now friends, that's a vivid picture of what happens in an, in an abortion. And there are some very brutal ways to do that. I don't have to describe all those to you. It's murder. We can call it abortion. We can call the child in the womb a fetus if we want to. But when we call it a fetus, we take away any guilt and we 
dull the guilt because we're killing a fetus, we're not killing a child. Well, no, you're killing a child when an abortion is performed. Don't do that. Don't encourage anybody to do that. Every time you can speak out against it, do so. Because children are dying. They're not getting to be children in this world. And they deserve that right. Well, if one learns as a child, what is it like? One man said that it's like ink written on a clean paper. But if you only learn when you get old, the same author said that it's like ink on a blotted paper, on a blurry page. When is the best time to learn? Well, we're told by educational people, by people in education, that the threshold of learning is at its apex from the ages of about three to six or seven. A child has tremendous ability to learn a language, to learn mathematics, those types of things at those ages. They're just open books. They're, they are vessels that are waiting to be filled. What are we filling our children with? How much time are you giving to your child? In the Jewish religion, the Jewish people say, give me a child for the first seven years, and then you may do anything you please. After that, he will still remain a Jew. Well, Nikolai Lenin, you remember that name? Talking about those that were involved in communism in his country. In his speech to the commissars of education in 1923, you know what he said? All we need is a child for eight years and he will be a communist forever. Wow. First eight years. You see, people recognize that language or that threshold. And in our school systems, friends, we need to be careful what we're teaching our children. Someone has said that problems in a nation will never be solved until we can educate our children properly. And I believe that's true. But you look at what's being taught in schools today and what's been not taught. I remember a time when prayer was something that was regular at school. When reading scripture over the intercom was something we did to start our day along with the pledge and the, and the Star Spangled Banner being played. But yet today, we see those things are changing. Thankfully, we just had a renewal of prayer being allowed in school. I'm glad for that, aren't you? We should be a prayerful nation. Well, Christian parents, <coughs> pardon me, are to train their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But let me hasten to say, it is not just Christian parents, New Testament Christian parents that are to do that. That is everyone. Children are to obey their parents, Ephesians 6 and verse 1. But fathers are to train up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, that's your job. You don't get to go hunting and leave it with the wife. You're a dad. You brought that child into the world. You're not just a donor. You are a person that's supposed to be a father to that child. How much time do you take with your child? How much time do you take spending time with them as individuals? You may have two or three, but you don't raise them as a gang. You spend time with each one of them. Train them up. Training involves time. The admonition of the Lord involves knowledge. The training and admonition of the Lord. God gave you a guidebook to raise them. People say, I didn't get a guidebook. I don't know what to do with children. Well, read your Bible. It'll tell you. God's law is the law that we should be abiding by. Again, while they're tender and impressionable and can be taught, you ever heard the phrase in the poem, as the twig is bent, so goes the tree. It's awful hard when a tree gets fully grown to guide it to grow straight up. But if while it's still young, you're able to tie a rope on it and to bring it to a straight position, that tree will be able to be bent in the right way much easier. 
So the time to train our children is in childhood. We don't train them with the words of human wisdom, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 4. The wisdom of men, we don't train them with those things. Well, the wisdom of men would tell you to do whatever pleases you, to choose your own way. Did you know that identity with a child, imprinting identity on a child about where they should be, what they should be doing and where they should be going is something that is a responsibility of parents? Take time with them. Listen to them. At a young age, listen to their concerns. Know your child. Well, the wisdom that is from below, James 3 tells us, verse 15 and 16, is earthly and it's sensual. And that's what you'll have if you allow the world to raise your child, if you allow society to raise your child, or the education system to raise your child, and that's all they get. They'll, be, they'll learn sensuality and earthly things and worldly things, but they won't learn the things that are necessary to sustain their souls, friends. Wisdom that is from above. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs 9 and verse 10, says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Well, if you're missing these passages, we'll put them up here for you. In Job chapter 28 and verse 28, to man he said, behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Now you parallel that with what's being taught to, to young people today. We're taught that it's kind of do whatever you want to. And nobody can put any boundaries on you. We can't tell you you're wrong. But the Bible says you can. Well, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. It will preserve you. It will keep you. It will promote you. It will bring you honor, the proverb writer teaches us. Wisdom will give you an, an ornament of grace and a crown of glory, as we've already read. In James 1 and verse 12, the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him is what James says that we all have waiting for us if we're trained in the ways of the Lord. In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, Solomon says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come. And the years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Remember your Creator when? In your youth. Right at the beginning. In the days of your youth, before difficult days will come. In the parable of the sower and the, so and the, and the soil in, in Luke chapter 8, the seed that was sown among the thorns was choked by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life, and it brought forth no fruit to maturity. What's involved in remembering our Creator, friends? How do you teach a child to remember their Creator? Well, first of all, you have to let make them know, make them aware that we were created. Recognize that we are a creation of God. We didn't just crawl out of the slime somewhere. One man observed a few years ago that we've raised our children to believe that we're no more than elevated animals, and then when they act like it, we get upset with them. Well, friends, you need to teach your child he's a special creation of God, that God formed him in the womb, and he's a precious blessing from the Lord, and that everything that exists, God made it. We have a Creator. Remember Him. You were formed in my inward parts, as we just read. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, not evolved. I am an individual. I did not come from an animal. I am not a part of some type of slimy amoeba that elevated itself by accident, and here I am. No. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden, Psalm 139, from you, when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. You saw my substance. Everything that we have 
We are made by God. And again, you need to let your children know that. Now someone says, well, they'll learn that at school. No, they won't. They won't even learn that in some churches. Did you know that? There are a number of people that are religious people that believe in theistic evolution. In other words, God started it and then it went from there. But its evol evolution is, came from God. That's how God made everything. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. Read Genesis 1 through 3. We need to teach our children. Part of remembering our Creator is not just recognizing that we are a creation, but also that we will give God His proper place in our lives. Don't send your children to church. Go with them. Let them see that you love God, and that you love His ways, and that you are practicing His precepts, and that you remember Him. Don't just ask them to do it. You do that. It's best for everybody. And by the way, what we're talking about here tonight about children and parents, this is what we're talking about to have a good home, friends. If you're watching tonight and your home's a wreck, you need to straighten it out. God charges adults with doing that. Now, if your children are the adults in the house, you need to ask God to forgive you. You need to change your ways and stand up and be a man and a woman and raise your children properly. That's what God wants. That's how we have happy homes. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verses 20 through 23, Proverbs 6 verses 20 through 23, look at this chart. My son, keep your father's commandments. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they'll keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a light, is a lamp, and the law is a light. Repro reproofs of instruction are the ways of life. Boundaries, breaks. We are to arm our children just like we make sure our car is running properly before we go on a trip. We want to arm our children with a good running system and a good braking system. We want to make sure that they have good tires, that they have good brakes, that they have good steering, and that they know where they're going. A good GPS system. We want to make sure that our children are guided in the right way. And come back to me now. Hello? There we go. Bind these commandments. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 8, verse 11 through 18, when we roam and when we sleep, we just read, His Word speaks to us. God's commandment is a lamp to our feet and a light lamp into our pathway. Leads to the way of life. Childhood shows the man as morning shows the day, Milton said. In Ephesians 6, 1 and 2, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. You honor your father and your mother. It's the first commandment with promise. So it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. That's Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children, do what? Obey your parents. But not in everything, friends. Sadly, many parents train their children in the wrong ways. They train their, their children to do things they shouldn't be doing. He says this is the right thing for children to obey their parents in the Lord. Now children, you do not have to obey your parents when they're telling you to do wicked things. But you are to obey them when they tell you the things of the Lord. And then the reciprocal arrangement there is that we as children as time goes on, we honor our parents. We do not get to tell our parents, no, I hate you. But yet we hear that a lot today, don't we, friends? I hope that there's not a child that's listening or a parent that's listening that will let a child get by with that or a child will try that. Your parents love you. They brought you into this world. 
And if they're the parents that God wants them to be, they're trying to make sure that you are not only comfortable here, but that you have a place to go eternally. Now, friends, I want to ask you something. If you're a parent tonight, if you raise the smartest child in the world, the best athlete in the world, but you have not taught them in the precepts of God, you have been a failure as a parent. Someone says, oh, I don't, how much emphasis do we put on sports? When I was younger, no one ever thought of playing a ball game on Wednesday, and certainly not on Sunday. But you just ride to church in the morning, and you will see little kids and parents playing ball. What type of message are we sending our children? when we give more emphasis and we turn our world upside down to be at their sports event, but we can't find the time to take them to church. And we let our children play sports instead of being with the Lord's people. What kind of message does that teach? What kind of message does that give to anyone? Is that remembering our Creator? Is that us as parents training our children to remember who, who we serve and who we honor? Do you know that if you went to four hours of worship services a week out of 168 hours, you've given the Lord about 1% of your time, maybe, in the whole of things? Well, that's not much, is it? Well, you don't think that that's important? Oh, but if our children make all-stars and they have to be at all-star practice every day for three or four hours, we will get them there, won't we? What do you think we're teaching our children? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, remember, in the Old Testament, the Jews were told that they were to train their children, they were to bring them up, they were to bring these things out, the events of their life, the God that they served, and they were to talk about those daily. They were to make sure that the child was, that these things were instilled in them, that they knew who they served and they knew why. And they knew that God was great and God is good. In Acts 5 verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. Do your children know that? That it's more important to serve God than it is to serve themselves or men. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 2, very beautiful passage that came to my mind when I was over at my dad's 95th uh, birthday here not long ago. Look at this chart, if you will. Leviticus 19 and verse 2. You shall rise before the gray-headed, and you shall honor the presence of an old man, and you will fear your and you fear God, because I am the Lord. The Lord setting out a principle there about honor. If we do not know how to honor properly those who are aged and wise among us, we will not honor God. We learn to honor by giving homage and to whom homage is due. We don't worship them, but we do honor them people need to be honored for the good that they do. But certainly God needs to be feared and God needs to be loved. But we will rise up. Look at what the Moses wrote us in Leviticus 19 too. Rise up before the gray-headed. Do you know that if a child didn't do that in the first century, that the common everyday idea was that if an older man walks in the room, everybody stands up. Everybody honors him. And a lady who is older, oh my, you always would give her your seat on any type of transportation you had. Obedience to parents in the Bible is a very important subject, and it's a Bible subject. The law of Moses, a rebellious, disobedient child that, couldn't, that you could do nothing with, in Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21, they were to be stoned so that there would not be sin in the camp of, of Israel. And he wouldn't affect, with his rebellion, others. So, a rebellious, disobedient son was disciplined. One who cursed his father or mother was put to death under the old law, friends. Uh, that's not something we do today. 
But the Lord was building the nation. And he knew that if a child grew up with the attitude that he could just curse his parents, that he would be a problem in the society. And that is true. You don't take care of the problems you've got at home, it'll become the law's problem. And they won't be quite as nice as you will. In Matthew 15 and verse 4, Jesus cites this about the idea of training up your children in the right way. In Romans 1 verse 30, Paul cites disobedience to parents as among mankind's sin that led him away from God. They're disobedient to parents. They don't have natural affection. Ecclesiastes 11, 9 through 10 <clears throat> tells the young person to keep himself pure. Are you teaching your young people to be pure? Are you teaching your children from a young age to keep their mind pure? Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. God wants young people to be happy, folks. That's what He wants. He says, let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart, because your heart's tuned to God, you see. And in the sight of your eyes, because your eyes are set on God. But then He says this, you know this, that for all the th these things God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, Remove sorrow from your heart, and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are empty. In other words, it's not going to last forever. So enjoy your youth. Now parents, I want to ask you something. Are your children happy? One of the sad things that we have in our society is young people, and it's getting younger and younger, that are so depressed that they just go out and kill themselves. That's horrible. That's a horrible thing for society. Are your children happy? And what type of happiness do they need? They need parents who love them and express it to them often. They need parents that read the Bible to them, that care enough to spend time with them. That's what they need. To tell them of the things of purity, to not, to not sap their innocence with sordidness and with sinful things. We have a society that has taken away the innocence of a whole generation of young people because of the wickedness that has been so pervasive and the adults, quote, have been a part of that. What do your children, what comes into your front room on the TV? What do your children get to listen to? What do you allow them to look at on their phones? Well, you see, all these things matter because a child grows rebellious when all they're filled with is the world. Childhood and youth are vanity. The word vanity comes from the idea of a vapor. Let, our heart, let your heart cheer you, but remember you face the Lord in judgment. So remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your eyes. Have you ever heard somebody that had a friend, a young friend, you ever heard children say it was easier to be good when I was with them, Daddy? They're good people. That's a good, that's a good friend, friend. If you have friends that it's easier to be good around them, then you have some type of friend. It's just easier to be good with them. Children choose friends. Make sure they choose the right ones. In Matthew 18, verse 3, Jesus thought so much of childhood that He told, told all of us, unless you're converted and become like a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew chapter 19, He goes on to say about children of such is the kingdom of heaven. Little children were coming to Him. He said, don't, for, don't, don't forbid them to come to Me because this is what the kingdom of heaven is made up of. What was he talking about? Well, certainly children are innocent, but also he's talking about that we must be pure and unpretentious in our faith in God, and that we serve Him without any remorse of any kind and in true purity and in true innocence. Well, the experience, experience is the child of thought. And thought is the child of action, Disraeli said. 
In Psalm 119, verse 9, how can a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed according to your word. And we're going to pause here for just a minute and let you know <clears throat> that this program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. And again, we ask you not to send us any money, but we are talking about tonight <clears throat> about our lives and about the course of our lives. Now, we've talked about, first of all, being allowed to be a child, to be able to come into this world and not prohibited by it by abortion. We're also talking about the innocence of a child and the exuberance of a child, the joy of a child, and how a child needs to have a happy life. Friends, I want to ask you and, and, and put one more thought in your mind. Parents, we're getting to the point now where all the spring sports are going to be coming up. Would you do me a favor and do your child a favor? Ask them if they want to involve themselves in those sports. And don't put them in a sport because you want, to, you want them to play. And I'm speaking from experience. We raised three sons, and we also, I coached all of them. And as time went on, I asked my children later on, as they were grown, I asked them, I said, what could I have done differently to help you be a better person? They said, well, we would have rather gone hunting and fishing maybe than been in so many sports. Well, we asked them and they all told us they wanted to play the sports they played. And they all put the kingdom first and what we did, we made sure of that. But even at that, you know, sometimes a child just wants to sit and talk with dad. A child just wants to sit and talk with mom. And they don't want a whole lot of interaction with anybody else, they want you. Don't lose sight of that, friends. Remember that children are your possession. They're blessings from God. And you take the time to make their childhood a happy time and not a time where they are sad. Joy of a little child, the giggles of a young child, the innocence of a young child is not to be invaded they have a right to those beautiful years, and they have a right to be molded and made in the right way, learning the things they need to learn, and disciplining them in the way they need to be disciplined with love. But they deserve that. They are a blessing, and God charged you as a parent to raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Well, the psalmist observes in Psalm 119, verse 9, that a young man can cleanse his ways by taking heed to the Word of God. Did you know that adolescence is something that is fairly new as far as a classification of our lives? Did you know that, generally speaking, in the ancient world, that a child was a child until about 12, and then they were an adult? Now, lifespans were shorter, understand that, but there was not a whole lot of in-between. The adolescent years were considered adult years. Well, adolescence, as we call it, comes from the Latin word adolescence, growing up and not yet come to full growth or youth, according to Lewis and Short in their commentary. And also, the state or period extending from about 14 to 25 years of age in man and from 12 to 21 in women. That's the new dictionary of the English language. Well, the Latin Vulgate in Ecclesiastes 11.10 talks about childhood and uses the term adolescence. For adolescence and youth are vanity. Train up adolescence, a child in the way he should go and when he's old. He'll not depart from it, Proverbs 22, 6. Again, there is an emptiness to childhood. It doesn't last forever, but while we are in it, let's enjoy it. But know this, that we'll be going through a particular period of our time, of our lives, called adolescent period. These are stormy years most of the time. 
In the Bible, there was no transition period from children to adult. As children, they worked hard at chores. They were responsible for helping their families survive. They married young, they had to work to survive, and they had a shorter lifespan. Because we're healthier and better cared for and nourished, adolescence today brings earlier and la comes earlier and lasts longer. Well, in the ancient world, and this, is, this hit me strong in the time, this is from the life of Pliny, in the time period of Pliny, who was a historian for the Roman Empire. The law of Rome fixed marriageable age for women at 12 years old. Ooh, hate that, don't you? When a girl passed her 19th year, she was no longer under ordinary circumstances eligible for marriage. Well, again, life lifespans were shorter at that time. In India and in the Saharan Africa area, over 15% of the women, 50% of the women today marry between the ages of 15 and 19. Now, Laura, who was Laura Ingalls Wilder, you remember that? Little House on the Prairie? Well, she was 15 years old when she started her career as a school teacher. Again, time frames were shorter, time spans. What are some of the challenges of being a teenager, being an adolescent? Well, you're not a child yet, or you're not a child anymore, but you're not yet an adult either, particularly in our society. I sometimes want to live in both worlds, Pound says about young people that are teenagers. I know in the long run God's the best choice, but I want to be a teenager. I want to experience life and make my own choices, even if they aren't the best sometimes. Well, that's the dilemma. And you think you tie on to this, an adolescent, a person, a young person that is 14 to 25 years old, and they've not been taught in the ways of God, it's no wonder they're confused. No wonder they're wondering. No wonder they get depressed. Again, what were they taught when they were younger in childhood? Because in adolescence, they begin to stretch their wings and start applying what they have learned. If they've learned they're just a lump of slime that crawled up out of a swamp, they don't have any worth. If they're told even by the religious leaders that there's no capacity for good within them at all, that they're wicked, they're horrible. Well, that's not much comfort, is it? Well, what about peer pressure? That's a real strong thing with young people. They, it matters to them what, young, what people talk, think about them. And the observation of one young, young person was, I sometimes get left out of certain activities if I'm a Christian and act like a Christian like I should. So my group of friends changes constantly. Some of my friends don't accept how I am good. And it can really be hard to be in a party city, in a party environment with, my, with the people I associate with, and I'm the odd man out. That is, that's trouble. But can you resist that? Remember what the, what the proverb writer said that we read to start with? Don't go that way. Don't go down those roads. All right? An intemperate youth, Cicero, said this in the Roman Empire, and he was no class act himself. But he says an intemperate youth brings about old age to a worn out body. Become old early if you wish to stay old long. Well, establishing security and identity. Trying to find yourself as we use the phrase today. Who am I? Where am I going? Why am I here? What's my purpose? Who, what, when, where, and why? These are questions young people have struggling for an identity. Who am I? Well, you know, that's a hard question for some adults to answer. They don't like the answer. But when you're younger and you remember your Creator in your youth, like Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, then you're an individual that you know who you are. You're a child of God. You're a special possession from the Lord. You were bought with a price, and He loves you. And He wants you to come live with Him forever. You always have a place with God. And He'll never leave you or forsake you. You'll never be lonely if you walk with the Lord. And so when you stand for Him, He is so proud of you. And it's worth it to stand for the Lord. 
Because in the end, young, per young person, it is your soul that matters the most, not what happens circumstantially each day, peer pressure, things like that that come up your way. These will last for a moment in all things. We make them the major thing. We get into drama, you know, drama, drama, drama. I was treated this way, somebody looked at me this way, and I've got a pimple. All these types of things are things that matter to us when we're younger, but you know, in the whole scheme of our lives, they will fade quickly. Struggling for your identity. What attitude am I going to choose? I need to be a responsible person. But yet at the same time, I want to be irresponsible. I'm struggling with that. Well, the Lord offers you guidance. His rules are the ones you apply. The authority in your life is the Lord, and you know that. You have a true north. You can always find your way home to God. You respect the rules of God. That's whose rules you live by. What kind of lifestyle will I adapt, will I adopt? Will I try to conform to the world? Well, just like with anybody, young person or older person. We do not conform to the world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our mind from God's Word. That's how we keep going. What lifestyle do you live? The, glory, the godly lifestyle. The lifestyle that says the kingdom comes first and righteousness comes first. All the other things of life will follow if I put the Lord where He belongs, and that's in first place. Well, how do I get along with people my age? How do I get along with people who are older? What do I do? How do I get along with people? Well, we're awkward when we're adolescents. We're changing. And there can be a lot of different things that we want. We, sometimes we want to impress the wrong types of people. But again, we need to recognize that if we have learned and been trained to respect the older, you know, one of the things that I, that I remember from my teenage years and my adolescent years, I had a grandmother. That boy was she wise. Now, my, my conversations with my grandmother would consist of me talking and her going, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, well, that's right. And then she would come up with the conclusion and she'd say, well, son, what do you think? Well, I don't know, Mimo, I'm asking you. She said, well, if you listen to yourself, you've answered your own question. Now, what did you say? And she would reiterate what I had said. You know what I'd do? I'd say, thank you for the great advice, Mimo. <laughs> you know what she did? She listened and she took note of what I was saying. And she realized and told me, you've solved your own problem, son. The answer was always there. You just had to find it. Boy, that's wisdom. If your young people don't have an older person like that to go to, find one. And take them around to visit them often. Because that's something that's missing in our society. You know, that's God's arrangement for the training of the young is for the old to teach the young, the old women to teach the younger women, the older men to teach the younger men. And so that's what God has authorized. There's always someone there, or should be, to teach. You know, the story of, jo of Joseph is a very important story for young people because Joseph's whole life, I mean, you think about if a person had a reason, a young person had a reason to complain, it'd be Joseph. His brothers sold him into slavery. Then when he was working hard and doing what he thought he should, he was put in jail for a false charge. He was accused falsely. And then when he was in jail, he rose to a, to a place of prominence. And then next thing you know, he should be released, but the fellow that said he was going to tell the king about him didn't do it. So he was cheated. He was mistreated. Now, let's look at that example. Turn to Genesis chapter 39, verse 1 through 5. Let's search the Scriptures and look at this. Young people, or if you parents, if you have a young person, think of this. I, now Joseph, had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites, 
who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. He was in the house of the master of an Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in this sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer of his whole house, and all that he had he put under his authority. And so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessings of the Lord were on all that he had in the house and in the field. The Lord was with Joseph, because Joseph was with the Lord. The Lord didn't leave him, did he? No matter how bad it was. Joseph was a successful man, young man, because he walked with the Lord. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because Joseph was there. He was a blessing to people he was around. In Genesis 37, 5 through 11, the Lord had promised him that his family would bow before him, and they ended up doing that. Now look at the contrast in Joseph, and now let's consider Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. I and Rehoboam went to, went to, I'm sorry, and Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. And so it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of the king Solomon, and dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and they called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam and said, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke that he put on it, and we'll serve you. And so he said to them, Depart from me for three days, then come back, and the people departed. So Rehoboam consulted the older who stood before his father Solomon while he lived. And he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? Now remember, he's talking to older people now. And they spoke to him and said, If you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, they'll be your servants forever. What's he saying? You serve them. You recognize that although you're a master and a king, the greatest king and master is one that serves. But he rejected the advice the older gave him, and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him, and he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer these people? who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke your father gave us. The young men who had grown up with him spoke to him and said, You should speak to the people who have spoken to you and say, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, I'll chastise you with scourges. Wow, that's great advice, isn't it? Who gave him that advice? His peers. We talk about peer pressure. You know, peers are not a good, a, a good group of people to go get advice from, friends. What do you care what your friends think? They don't know any more than you do. See? So who do you get your advice from? You get it, the best advice from those who are older most of the time. Listen to the wisdom, and know what wisdom is, so you can spot it, whether it comes from the young or the old, and know what foolishness is, so you'll know whether, it, uh, and you can identify it, whether it comes from an older person or a younger person. In James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. This is a good, this is good advice for uh, adolescents also. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When we're, when we're getting in, into the adolescent years, and our bodies are changing and those types of things, all of a sudden we get angry. We get upset with people. We have short fuses. That repeats itself later on in life oftentimes too. But know this, we all need to discipline ourselves and have self-control. Now parents, teach your children self-control. Teach them they don't get to pop off every time they want to. And adolescents, 
is an area where a lot of sassiness can come up. You need to let your children know these can be the best years of your life or the worst ones. But in this house, we serve the Lord. And we talk about things, and we talk about the things that are there. And you can say whatever you want to say, but make sure that it is decent when you say it, and make sure that you say it with respect. And we'll talk about it. Let them know that you're ready to listen, parents, but also let them know there's a point beyond which they dare not go. And they need to recognize that. Now, hopefully they've learned that at a young age. But if they haven't, you need to make sure they learn it here. Because again, you know, when somebody says, I've got teenagers, you know what they generally do? They roll their eyes, you know. Teenage years are not necessarily the worst years of your life. They should be some of the best ones. But if we train our children in the right ways, they will respect us. You remember what was quoted that uh, Mark Twain said about his father? He said when he was 16 years old, his father was, a dumbest, uh, was as dumb as a rock or something like that. He said, but when he turned 21, he said, it's amazing how much the old man had learned. Well, Langhorn Clemens had learned. Mark Twain had learned. His father was still giving the good advice. Listen to the older. They'll help guide you in the right ways. Plautus, who was a historian during the Roman Empire, says this about a young man. It behooves a young man to be modest. And that term modest means ordered. It behooves a young man to have an ordered life. Now, recently I've, I've talked with some young people from time to time, and you know what they say? That if they are do have it all together, it intimidates their friends. Well, it does what? It intimidates your friends to have it all together? Well, who cares? You know? Are you doing the right thing? Yes. Can you be a help to them? Yes. But should you worry that they don't like you being what God wants you to be? No, that shouldn't bother you. Because you're trying to please God. You're not trying to please men. So you set your course. You keep the course. You stay on the path of righteousness, and you do not depart to the right or to the left. And if you do, you admit it. You get up and you get it straight with God and with whoever else you need to get it straight with. And then you move on, and you forgive yourself as God has forgiven you from sincere repentance. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, Paul tells the Corinthians, to watch out who they hang out with. Very important passage. And you need to put this down if you're a parent and bring it up to your children. Don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Parents, one of the sad things is, and young people, one of the sad things is, is you can have the best parents in the world. But your friends can corrupt you. They can put pressures on you. They can have youthful temptations that will come before you. And you have a choice. Listen to the words of your father and your mother that the proverb writer told you to listen to. Or be like Rehoboam and listen to the advice of your friends. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. We have told our kids and our grandkids that the time to change friends is when your friends are influencing you more than you're having an influence over them. That's when you change friends because that's when friendship stops. When somebody tries to ask you to do something that is not fitting or pleasing before God. Well, let's turn to First Chronicles, or Second Chronicles, I'm sorry, and verse 34. And listen to Josiah, who became a king at eight years old. And he became king, reigned 31 years. He was 39 when he died. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of his father, David. He did not turn aside to the right, nor to the left, 
For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his ancestor David. We know David was not Josiah, Josiah's uh, father, but he was an ancestor. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molten images. Now there's Josiah, eight years old and twelve years old, and what did he do? He lived righteously. He lived godly. He put the kingdom, he put God first. Look at the example in the Bible of Daniel, Daniel 1 and verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Now just stop right there. It was a decision in his heart. He was convicted. He decided long before the challenge came that he would not depart from God. This was many years before he was placed in the lion's den. But he said, I will not defile myself. Here's a young man, his parents aren't even around, and he could get by with a whole lot less out of himself. But he decided that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine that he drank. So he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Was he respectful of the king? Yes, he was. Did he follow the law? He did. Did he compromise what was right? No, he did not. Because he knew what was right. Now on that other thing, when he was given an opportunity to drink wine, did he do it? No. Did he have to? Nope. He told him, I'm not drinking. I won't do that. Boy, if more young people were able to do that today and would do that today, it'd be a whole lot more or less accidents on the road and a whole lot more young people alive today. Because alcohol, friends, doesn't do anybody any good at all. The drinking of alcohol. Well, I beseech you, brethren, Romans 12, 1 and 2, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Young people, you need, if you're listening, and parents, if you're giving your young people advice, you need to give them the advice of the scriptures in this passage. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Several years ago, I was working in the furniture business, and a lady I was working with had a call from her daughter. And she related that to us, that her daughter was in bad shape one night, that her boyfriend had made advances toward her that he shouldn't, and she had called her parents to come get her, and they had. And the girl talked to her mother, and her mother related this to us. She said, Mama, why did my fiancé treat me so badly? She said, I told him, Mama, that until marriage, my body belonged to me and God. And, not, and then after we were married, it would belong to him and me and God. You know, she was a, that was a wonderful statement for a young person to make. And her parents had somewhat of a talk with that young man. And by the way, it was good that they found out what they did because they did not get married. She was offended by his disrespect for her. And friends, young people, you need to recognize that virginity is not something to be laughed at, not something to be mocked in a movie. It's something to be cherished. It's a precious message. It's a precious thing that you have, that you take to your marriage, and you give it to the one that you have chosen to live with the rest of your life and be married to before God. Present your body a living sacrifice before God. That's acceptable. That's perfect will of God. You do that. And don't you let anybody talk you out 
of your purity. Don't you let anybody talk you out or belittle you or make you feel inferior because you're living a pure life. That's what everyone should do. And you're doing what you should. You keep it up, young people, if you're doing that. In Ephesians 4.29, admonition to the young and the old is to let no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. We used to sing a child song like that. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Because God's watching, and He knows what you're doing. In Hebrews 13, verse 4, it says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Again, young or old, God does not look down on fornication and adultery as something that's just normal and that everybody does. And so you just go along with the crowd, whatever you need to do, go ahead and do it. Well, be careful what you put into your body. Be careful about that. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Peter warns us. He says, I want you to know something. You watch out. You be sober. You be vigilant because you have an adversary. He's called the devil. And he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You've all seen the National Geographic uh, movies like we all have where the pride of lions is lurking and waiting for the weak one in the flock, the one who is hurt, the one who is suffering, the one that's sick. They don't go for the herd that is strong. They go for the weak one. They look for that weak one. And they're lurking and they're going to try to devour him, whatever it is. And usually it's a gazelle or something like that. Well, that's the way the devil does. He's busy. And he preys on the young person praise on all of us, but certainly he takes a particular delight in taking a young person out really early and discouraging them to ever think that they're even worth serving the Lord ever again. Well, watch out for that. Be careful. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, goes about seeking to devour. Watch what you put in your mouth. Watch what you put in your body. Stay away from liquor. Stay away from drugs. Stay away from all those things. Don't let anything have control of you more than Jesus Christ. Stay away from it. And then, young ladies and young men, adorn yourself in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. You don't have to have the most seductive clothes in the world to impress somebody. You don't need to be competing in sports with little to nothing on. Your body belongs, as we've said, to you and God and no one else. One day it will belong to you, God, and your spouse, but not until then. So you adorn yourself, ladies, in modest ordered, well-arranged, decent apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. That's the ability to blush. Someone says, well, how do you know what modest is? Well, you pretty well know. From the neck to the knees, cover it up. That's a pretty, pretty safe bet right there. Now, do people need to control their minds? Yes, but you don't need to advertise your body to everybody in the world. Your body is a private thing, and you keep it to yourself. And you do not go out and dress in a way to try to look, look at the attention that you get. And someone says, well, you know, uh, I have a son. Nobody lusts after boys. Oh, you haven't heard the young ladies talk like I have. I had three sons, and we'd sit in the stands and listen to it. And not just the young ladies, the mamas were just about the worst. Lusting after a young man. 
That's horrible. And we tell them so, by the way. That that's my son. I appreciate you not talking to them like that. You know? Well, I tell you what. You need to pay, pay attention to that. Because parents know well what goes on in the minds of adults. And you watch that. Friends, I just, I don't need to bring this up to you, but do you know that it's Charlotte, North Carolina is one of the main areas for trafficking of young people? They, some people come up and they kidnap them and they take them off, and who knows what happens to them? But the corridor from Charlotte all the way to Richmond, Virginia, is a big area where there is a lot of sordid things going on. Protect your children. Guard them. And daddies, you tell your daughter if she goes out of the house or wants to leave the house dressed immodestly, you tell her, no, uh, uh, no, no. You go put some clothes on and then you make sure she does. And you tell her, I love you and I, I care about you. I don't want you to be challenged by that. It, it's enough. To, when you've got modest clothes on, it's enough. There's always wicked people out there. But you do all you can to arm yourself with modest things. Well, in Luke chapter 2, verse 51 and 52, perhaps the greatest young, and it is, it is the greatest young person that ever lived with Jesus Christ. He, you know, he was young. He was. He was 12 years old. And he was in, in his father's house talking Bible with people. Early on, he had studied. He had been trained in the ways of the Lord. His daddy Joseph had taught him these things and brought him up the ways of a good Jewish father. And notice what it says, that he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to his parents. But his mother kept everything in her heart and Jesus increased, watch this, in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and men. Now, people that talk about how you, the, the completion of a whole person, They'll talk about a person needs to be trained intellectually, that's wisdom, and they need to be healthy, that's stature, and they need to be have some religious basis, and so that's God, and then they need to be trained socially, and that's man. So Jesus was a well-rounded young person. He grew in knowledge or wisdom, he grew in stature, he grew up like everybody does, and in favor with God that's first, and with men. So that's the way we are to train. That's kind of an outline of how we train our children. And notice the emphasis on decency, the emphasis on morality, the emphasis on good things. Certainly Jesus knew how to interact with people. We need to train our children to be polite to people, to know how to act around people. But we also need to, to, to teach them also above all things, that they honor God. Well, youth is meant to obey and old age to rule. And that's very true. Brother Irvin Lee, in his book, Good Homes in the Wicked World, he's a wonderful man. I knew him personally. He's passed away now, but he had this to say. And look at the chart. A child cost the parents many, many dollars along the way for clothes and food and doctor's bills and school expenses and many other things. But he shouldn't be made to feel any debt for the expenses except the debt of gratitude. If he has shown that gratitude by his big smiles, a hug, and if he's been obedient and trustworthy, he's more than paid his way. And the parents feel the wish that they could do more instead of less for him. And I think that's a good, good statement that bears quoting. A good, godly young person, the parents don't count the cost of what it costs to raise a child like that because he brings him such joy by his behavior. In Titus 2, 1 and 2, speak the things that are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, be reverent, be temperate, sound in faith and love and in patience, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, in all things showing themselves to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, and incorruptibility, 
sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. That's Titus 2, verses 5 through 8. Self-control. Train up a child in the way they should go. And these are the precepts of God as to how they should go. In 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, give all diligence, supply to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly love, or brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Friends, we make a mistake when we give our kids everything they want when they want it. Does that sound strange? How do you teach a child patience? How do you teach them to work for something if you give it to them and never let them know the value of anything? We've just come through a season where we've given kids, for the most part, most during this time, it's a common practice for adults to give children all kinds of things that they ask for. But I would venture to say that if you were to ask your young person right now, now do you remember all the things you got for presents? They'd be hard pressed to tell you because it was free. i tell you something though, you let a child work for something and they'll remember it all year because they put something into it. See? Now that doesn't say you shouldn't give your children gifts, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's an appreciation that comes from that which you have put something into that does not come when something is just given to you. This in, we, we live in an instant gratification society. You want something, you just go get it. And we are in a tremendously blessed society that usually will allow most of us to be able to do something like that. But sometimes parents have taught their children by their excesses that if you want something, you just get it. Parents, is your charge card charged up to the hilt because of your excesses? Train up a child financially too. Let them know the value of a dollar. Let them know that things cost money and that sometimes you have to say no, even though it might be something right to have. You have to say no until I can afford it and you work for it. Let them put something into it. Learn the value of perseverance, of self-control, of waiting, because if everybody has everything when they want it and when they demand it. Do you know what you've done? You've raised a narcissist. You've raised a child that if he doesn't get his way and if he's not the center of attention all the time, then he'll get to be the center of attention in a negative way. In 2 Peter 1, 8 through 10, if these things be in you and abound, they make you to neither, to neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of Christ. For he that lacks these things is short-sighted, he's blind, and he's forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never fail. Are you amazed at how much guidance there is in the Bible on how to raise children? Yeah same guidance on you as to how to raise yourself in the, Christ, in the Lord, isn't it? It's not a secret. It's in the Scriptures, friends. They give us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, Paul refers to childhood when he says this, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood like a child, and I, I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childishness. Yeah, that's the course of growing, isn't it? There's a course of growing. When you're a child, some things are accepted. When you're an adolescent, some things are accepted. When you get to be a man, though, you put away those childish behaviors. And you don't pout, you don't stomp your feet, you don't run around, and, and your parents don't spank you anymore. Because you're a man, and you're responsible. Parents, your job is to teach them the right ways, to show them the paths. 
but there's, there's a point where the child has to walk the path by themselves. And you need to train them to where they know where that path is. Well, our time is fast going right now and we've had a good study tonight. We're gonna to talk about the stage of being an adult tomorrow, or, or I'm sorry, on the, I think it's, well, two weeks from now, so that'll be about the 18th of February, I believe. So if you will tune in for then, we'll talk about adulthood, and then we're gonna talk about old age a little bit. We're gonna talk about marriage and what the Bible says about marriage. And that'll be on the next program. Stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll be, in a couple of weeks, we'll be covering that subject. Again, we want to thank you tonight. We've had a little bit of problem with our phones this evening, but uh, we apologize to you for that, technical difficulties, but we will certainly get that remedied and make sure that we uh, do that because, again, you have honored us by allowing us into your home, and we want to thank you for that. We want you to know that this program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. I've been on this program for about eight years now. And it has been my pleasure to be on this program. And I have enjoyed it beyond measure. I cannot tell you how it's helped me to grow as a Christian. But for the last few months, I've been working with the Lincoln Church of Christ in Lincoln to North Carolina. And I've been doing this program uh, at the request of the Newton Church of Christ. And I will, I will be fading out of this program uh, I will have my last show on March, the, the first week of uh, time in March that we have it. And then Brother Stephen Deaton will be presenting the program here. And I want you to give him your attention when that happens. In the middle of March, the second program in March, he will be coming your way. And I want you to give him your attention because he is a very, very capable young man. Uh, he's a whole lot younger than I am, but uh, he will do an excellent job of presenting God's Word to you phones will still be open. You'll be invited to call in. And again, we urge you to give him your attention. The program will be taking that direction with a new speaker again, just like it did when I came a few years ago. And Brother John Cripps was doing the program. One of the things that's been a joy to watch and to see happen in this program has been the interest that so many of you have had, the time that you take to call in to the program, to ask your Bible questions. It's impressive that people will take time to listen and to study God's Word and to call in with their Bible questions, even if we don't agree sometimes, and that has happened. I want you to know that it has been respected that you are willing to defend what you do believe. You know, if you believe something, you ought to know why you believe it, shouldn't you? And so we thank you for that honesty that you have in defending the things that you believe in. We thank you for that, and we hope that you'll continue to call in with your questions for us. Again, the next lessons will deal with marriage, and who should you marry? Who does somebody have a right to marry? It'll deal with adulthood and the changes that come. All of a sudden, you're married, you have a family, you have uh, obligations, and sometimes it feels like that the weight of the world is pouring in on you. You're trying to keep your job, you're trying to support your family, and you have the kids, and as ladies, you're going to have kids, and you're going to be uh, doing all you can to make sure they're doing the things they should be doing. And again, it may just be overwhelming. And so we're going to talk about some of the challenges that come in midlife, challenges that come in adulthood, challenges that come from marriage, and the challenges that come from being older. I've realized uh, very recently that I'm going down the valley, you know, just like we've been talking about. And all of us, our hair turns gray, it falls out, and our body hurts when we get up and when we sit down, you know. Does the Bible address this? How do I serve God in my, in my old age? What are some of the challenges that I have? Do I have a challenge to sit, sit around and do nothing and think that all it, we'll just leave it all to the young people? Should we just stop fighting the battle because we're getting older? Nope. 
And we're going to talk about that. So these are subjects we'll be, we'll be discussing. We're going to talk about midlife problems. We're going to talk about the, uh, as people talk about it today, the midlife crisis times where a guy is not sure or a woman's not sure they want to grow up and they want to get older. And they begin to look back on their uh, frivolous youth and they long to be there and they don't want to grow up. And how do you cope with that? What does the Bible teach about that? So think about that and we'll be discussing that in our next program. Again, we want you to know that the, this is the most important chart that we could ever put up. And that's the chart of hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, and being faithful until you die. That's what it's all about, folks. Have you done this? Have you been obedient to Jesus Christ? Is your soul secure? Remember we talked about at the beginning of the program, you have 27,000 days when you're born. And then as you go on and live, if you're 65, you have 3,650 left. If you're 50, you have 9,300 left. If you're 25, you have 18,000 left. That's if you live to 72, 74. But any time in between, you're not promised that. So number your days properly and put them all under the guidance of the Lord. We invite you to attend the assemblies at the Newton Church of Christ. Wonderful group of people, good folks. Each Sunday at 9.30 and uh, worship times at 11 o'clock on Sundays. And then Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. The Word and Sword is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. It's in excess of 35 years now this program's been coming to you. And we urge you, if you will, to take advantage of every opportunity to study God's Word. And the brethren at Newton be glad to study God's Word with you. And we hope that you will do that. Contact, contact them at uh, contact at wordandsword.com. Contact them by phone at 828-4865-3009. And by mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. Again, we thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We'll come to you again on February the 18th. Again, the year is going by quickly. And uh, February will uh, be our second program in February 18th, and then March, and we're into the third month, man. The, world, the time, time is flying, and that's what we've talk, talked about tonight. The older you get, the faster time moves. But we want to continue to study God's Word. That's our emphasis, is what does God word, God's Word teach? Do that. Please the Lord. Go by what His Word teaches. Thank you for your time tonight. And good evening.